This Week in Startups is brought to you by Walker Corporate Law, a boutique law firm specializing in the representation of entrepreneurs. Visit them at walkercorporatelaw.com. And Blue Apron. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and I am an angel investor and entrepreneur. And on the show, we typically have entrepreneurs and investors. And sometimes we have journalists, and we never, ever have professors. It like never happens. Maybe one out of 500 times we'll have a professor on the show or somebody who works in academia. Typically, you've heard me say, ah, I'm not so big on MBAs. And you hear that in the Valley, ah, MBAs, I'm not sure if that's worth it at the time. Maybe you should just start a company. God, here in the Valley, we even look at undergraduate as a waste of time. Why, do you, why are you wasting time? Be an entrepreneur. Now, all that being said, I am a little jelly that I never got to go to Harvard Business School. I can admit it now. <laughs> And uh, I always wanted to go to a place like Wharton or Harvard or Stanford. But listen, I was a C-minus student. We all know that. It's been pretty well documented. Now I just give the keynote at those places, which is fantastic. Like I come in as a visiting uh, professor or a keynote. Uh, that's great. But I still am a little bit hurt that they didn't realize my brilliance when I was younger. Uh, all that being said, <laughs> I'm being slightly facetious. My guest today, I stumbled upon her on the internet. And it was... Um, just this great revelation to me because there was somebody out there studying what I do every day. Somebody was studying how angel investors make decisions. And I found, I happened to f bump into this research and these videos and really compelling stuff while I was writing my book, Angel, on angel investing. And I was like, wow, in my book, my central premise was nobody studies this. This is a very new thing. There's no data on it. So I'm going to write a book about it. Lo and behold, I finished the book. And I find out there is somebody with data on it. Uh, so I'm going to have to include it in my follow-up book. But my guest today is Laura Huang. And she is a professor at Wharton School of Business at UPenn. And you are studying what? So I study how angel investors make decisions. Um, and it's funny that you mention all of in your preface because yeah. a lot of times I get the question, can you even teach entrepreneurship? Right. And so my first answer is always, well, obviously you can teach it because that's what my business card says, right. professor of entrepreneurship. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, but you know, it's, it's, it's not taught in the same way that we think about finance or accounting or those right. sorts of disciplines, right? It's a lot of this experiential, putting yourself in the trenches, how you would react and that sort of thing. And it's very similar in the investment world as well, right? When you're actually studying how angel investors make decisions, um, there's not one clear-cut answer. Right. Um, angel investors come in lots of different breeds and forms. And, right. you know, this, this topic was, um, you know, one of the ways that I, one of the reasons why I was so fascinated by it is because there is so much uncertainty and there is so much risk and there's so many different ways to think about how angel sure. investors make decisions. Um, and so, yeah, so that's how I really got started in it. And there's lots of research on economic factors, people, how, how you can actually quantify, you know, um, you know, com the competitor space or the sure. strategy or the market. And what I realized was that investors actually use that, but that's not really what's driving their decisions. At the angel stage. Now, at, at the, the angel venture stage, capital stage, there's been tons of research, yes, right? Yes, yes. And at the venture capital stage, because it's later stage, they do have more metrics to go on. They do have more ah, data, sure. what people would call, you know, hard data. Yeah. But even at that stage, the data sometimes are just hopes and dreams and guesses sure. of the entrepreneurs. And so um, what's considered perhaps a rational decision based mm. on economic analysis, would be very different than right. when, when you're looking at early stage investments. And of course, investors. in the public market, you have analysts, you have an entire group totally. of people yes. who are paid to just study the data. And you have the SEC forcing people to put out public data. And so it's very easy um, to come up with a thesis on a public company because they have to publicly state their numbers. On private companies, it's much more opaque. Now, you've done Absolutely. some other research that I just want to tease now, which is um, <laughs> ugly people. You want to tease me or you want to tease, the, tease the listeners? I'm going to tease the <laughs> listeners here. But yeah, I'm not going to tease you about your research. <laughs> but you will actually um, have studied um, 
marginalized groups mm-hmm. and how they fare. Yes. And included in these marginalized groups, not just women. Yes. Um, I don't know if you studied underrepresented minority groups. I have to the extent I've looked at accent. I've actually okay. looked at the impact of accent and okay. some race, ethnicity sort of questions. Okay. Yeah. And then one that hits home with me because obviously I'm a cis white male, so I have, everything is going <laughs> for me. Um, but- you also studied ugly people like me <laughs> and our propensity to get funded. I don't know. You're doing okay. I'm doing okay. <laughs> solid, as I tell my wife, solid seven, but I'm funny. So that gives you an extra two points uh, in my experience. But you did actually study as well. I did. Good looking people. I did. And I did. ugly people and the propensity. So uh, when we get to the second segment, I want you to tell me who has a harder time raising money. Okay. I'm gonna, this, is, this is like the ultimate tease. Yeah. Women or ugly men? Okay. But I will. Yeah, we'll just, just tease. The, the, we'll we'll just, just tease the audience for now. We won't. Right. We won't reveal that yet. Right. So yeah. that'll be in our second segment. But let's get back to the first segment, which is angel. What have you learned about angel investors and how they make decisions? Because a lot of the audience here uh, are entrepreneurs, and they're always trying to reverse engineer yeah. what our thinking is and what our process is to game the system. Mm-hmm. And there is a whole discussion to be had about, is it even worth gaming the system or does it work or not? But tell me what you learned and how, and maybe even stepping back before how you learned it, how did you construct a study of yeah, this? Yeah, absolutely. So let me talk a little bit about the method first. Yeah, so, the method. Um, you know, for a question like that, um, a lot of it goes into it and it's not just one way that... Uh, to go about it, right? So first I started with interviews, just interviewing hundreds of investors and asking them very basic questions. You know, how did you first get started in angel investing? How do you make your decisions? Mm. Those sorts of things. And lots of- Open-ended questions. Open-ended questions, lots of probing. Like, tell me about a time when when you Uh. invested in somebody because of this, or tell me about a time when you didn't invest in someone, even though the financials looked really strong. And Mm. then what happened? Those sorts of things. So, um, but in in order to really get at this question, it had to be a multi-method study. It had to be lots of different methods. So what I did in addition to that was, so for example, from those interviews, I would take those quotes and do content analysis to see, Mm. do they care about the entrepreneur's passion, their trustworthiness, their commitment? What is it about that? And then I took those variables and I went out into the field. Um, I looked at numerous pitch competitions, dozens of pitch wow. competitions. And I would take those videos and code them based on trustworthiness, commitment, passion, those attributes wow. to see what correlated with who actually got investment funding, got it. as well as how they did three years, four years, five years, six years wow. down the road. So you looked at like TechCrunch Disrupt or the demo yes. conference or yes. launch festival. Yes, all of those. And really? Yep. Including launch festival? Not launch festival. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe you'll maybe you'll give me access. I'll, and give you I'll, access I'll do that. I'll do so that. Did you ask them yeah. for access to everything? Some of it. Some of these organizations provided me with high quality videos. Some wow. of it's publicly available. Got it. um, we did transcriptions of all of the pitches, Q and A wow. sessions, um, and then in addition, um, the third methodology that I do a lot is um, experimental methods, where I will give angel investors. I'll give them an executive summary for example. And what I'll do is I'll have different versions of the executive summary. And so in one version, I'll tweak it so that the market size is huge. In others, I'll tweak it so that the the entrepreneur um, demonstrates trustworthiness and Mm -hmm. others, they don't. So there's these conditions where one, they have perhaps a strong gut feel Uh and some, they have a weak gut feel. And then in others, there's strong business viability and there's others that have weak business viability. And I look for differences between conditions to see what's actually driving the decisions that that in investors are making. Fascinating. Now, where, where, how did you pick the investors? Because I wasn't one of them, obviously, or I would have known. I would love for you to be an well, investor I'm a in little future bit nervous study. about it because I have, <laughs> Well, we I, don't tie any individual identities yes. to these because I think that that's really, um, I think that's important for, right. the, for the investors to feel like there's this, they can freely answer. So we don't sure. actually have any subject level identifiers where we're tying it Got to it. the decisions that they're making. Um, but we are able to um, cluster based on things like gender yeah. and experience and that sort of thing. Um, the, 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 the kind of fourth, but in order to answer that, kind of, I'll answer that question as well, but um, I also have a partnership with the Angel Capital Association uh-huh. and the Angel Capital Association, basically, as you probably know, there's many, many different members, thousands of members, ah, and we have a survey. Not even part of it, never heard of it. Really? Yeah. 
Oh, I'm kind of like outside the. Yeah, you do your you roll yeah. by your own. Exactly. Yeah. I'm kind of yeah. like Bob Dylan. I kind of like yeah. do my own thing. No band, just me and an acoustic That's guitar. Right. Okay. If they wanted me to like give my data or be part of it, I'd be like, no. Yeah. Absolutely. Except not. you're gonna give it to me. You said so. Maybe. Yeah. We'll see. We have to talk <laughs> offline about it. I, ha- I have some ideas. Um, but yeah. So. Um, so anyway, so that provided a lot of access to they they answered surveys and and so on and so forth. Yeah. Got it. So when you did the. When you did the study, describe what the results were. So mm-hmm. I understand you did, in terms of methodology, you interviewed people, you yep. figured out what the trigger words were or the key, yep. whatever you call them, yep. the, the axes or the pivot points over how they make decisions, uh, traction, background of the entrepreneur, TAM, et cetera. But then you did these studies where yep. you studied the videos. Yep. And that could be a little bit biased because there are people, it's a pool of people who have gotten through a filter to get Absolutely, on stage. Absolutely, right. So they've already been pre-filtered. Yep. So they would represent, in my mind, probably 5% of the overall audience. Yep. And th- so they would be biased towards whatever the filtering mechanism was of the people running the event and having created not only Launch Festival, but also I created TechCrunch Disrupt when I was partners with Mike with TechCrunch 50. Yeah, yeah. So I created that criteria, yeah. actually. Oh, so neat. Okay. That's so. kind of interesting because it's a subgroup. But then the more interesting one to me is when you set up the investors, because I'm wondering, did you put like a female name or a ethnic name versus, you know, Charles Whitestone III from yes. Harvard. Yes. So we can absolutely manipulate based on different characteristics. Right. And so that's some of the things in different um, different research projects. The one that I initially set out to to study was based on gut feel. So my, my the research question I had in mind was that I I felt like there was all these economic factors, but in my interviews, especially the early interviews, um, I found that a lot of these investors would go back to something where they'd say, you know, and then I just had this feeling, or I just had this gut feeling about this person, Ah. or you know, gut played a role. It played a role, and that was what I was really curious about, right? You have this very economically driven thing, but a lot of investors kept coming to gut feel because. As we all know, when you're angel investing, you have very little to go on. Sometimes Absolutely. the product's not even launched. Yep. Sometimes the product's launched and has a de minimis amount of engagement or revenue. Right. So it would make sense that people would fall back to gut. But is it actually, what, what, what do they actually mean when they say gut? Because I don't think a lot, when I look at angel investors, a lot of them don't have a unifying theory. Uh-huh. Like maybe somebody who's done 150 investments like I have, you know, over five years. People who don't do this, I'll say professionally, they do it kind of casually. Uh-huh. It's really two different groups of people. So what did you find? Yeah, so that's exactly what I wanted to capture was there's all this opac- like there's all this opacity out there and uncertainty. And I wanted to find a way to quantify the unquantifiable, right? Taking something that is very amorphous, something like gut feeling, and figuring out what is actually embedded in that. What does it mean when investors say that they use their gut feel? And does it matter for somebody who perhaps has made 150 investments or yeah. somebody who looks at 300 or 400 deals a year versus somebody who looks at 10 deals a year, Mm. right? Um, So that experience piece absolutely mattered. Uh, What I found was was that it really does differ based on the investor. Um, Experienced investors do tend to use their gut feel more often. Uh And those who use their gut feel more often do perform better in certain ways. Okay. Okay. So what that means is if you think about baseball averages, right, and having a really high batting average. So in terms of the investment world, that would mean you do pretty well in terms of your portfolio. You make more than you lose, right? Gut feel doesn't actually help you. It doesn't help you in terms of just on the aggregate, most of your deals seem to do okay. You have a high batting average. Where gut feel helps you is where you have a much lower batting average, but you hit a lot more home runs. Ah. So those that you invest in, you might have lots more dogs, complete losses. Right. But you're much more likely to identify those big home runs. Right. And in an investment world where the portfolio matters, that's really what you're going for. You really want... Those big, well, not everybody, but, you know, to some extent. No, no, no. You want the big outside Yeah, you want the big 30X, 60X, whatever X kind of returns that. I'm looking for 5,000 next, but keep going. You want those. 30X, that's quaint. Yeah. Wow. But, you know, on the aggregate, people are looking for 2X, right? Right. You know, that's the kind of the, if you look at the aggregate. Right, right. right. People are. (laughs) 
<laughs> we'll have to talk more about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but they're really looking for those humongous right. uh, sort of exits that, so that more than pay for 30, right. 30 complete failures. So there are people who use their gut who, if I was going to look at that, just doing my own self-examination and the, my contemporaries, um, there are ones who are very promiscuous, <laughs> I would say, and they invest in a lot of things. Right. Uh, to use a word, um, and they understand nine out of 10 fail. Yes. And one of my organizing principles of angel investing is if everybody understands the idea and believes in it, then it, it will not have an outsized outcome. Yep. Because it's too obvious of an idea, it should have been done already. Yeah. So when something like Uber or Wealthfront or Robinhood or Thumbtack, which are my four unicorns and one decacorn, obviously, when I look at those, a lot of people said no. Uh huh. A lot of people yep. said no. Yep. And the list of reasons of why they wouldn't work was greater than the list of reasons of why they would. Yep. So how does that, what, what's your take on my take? Yeah, I think yeah. you're doing it the right way. And I'm not saying that just because you have immense amounts of money now yeah. <laughs> based on your investments. Well. No, I think that that's absolutely right. What the people who are looking for that diamond in the rough right. recognize that if everybody else thinks it's shiny and, and valuable, that perhaps somebody would have picked it up or something would have happened to it. What you're really looking for is that diamond in the rough that has that immense, huge beta that other people think is worthless, mm. but that you're, you see something special, that there's something special about that entrepreneur. Mm. There's something special about that market. There's something that's unique. There's an unfair advantage. You know, people talk lots about that, but, um, and I think that that's absolutely right. And I think that's what God feel really encompasses that it's able to capture that piece of it. All right, let's take a quick break. And then we're going to go to some charts from the study, uh, as well as just answer the question of um, ugly people, women, uh, and um, which one has a harder time raising funding and gotcha. what are our overall thoughts on that? Okay. Yep. When we get back on this week in startups. I want to first thank my friend Scott Walker for supporting startups, not just supporting This Week in Startups, but startups themselves. Walker Corporate Law, as you know, is a boutique law firm that specializes in the representation of entrepreneurs and startups. That's what they do. And they encourage fixed fees. What's that? They give you a fixed price. You know what you're going to pay to do your startup financing, to do your corporate formation, to do your trademarks, to do whatever you need to do, employee stock option plan, licensing, mergers, acquisitions, terms of service, privacy policy, all those things that are check boxes for your startup. They do uh, with lawyers that have decades of experience, 10, 20 years, no junior associates getting on the job training, and they specialize in startups. That's why they're so good at it. That's why they can give you fixed fees, and they're really in it for the right reason. Scott Walker comes to all of our events. He's a real true mensch, and he spends a lot of time talking to founders, and you can call him directly right now, 415 415- 979-9998, 415, that's San Francisco, 979-9998. Or you can email him, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, scott at walkercorporatelaw.com, or visit walkercorporatelaw.com. Scott's a great guy. Tell him your Uncle Jason sent you, and he'll take care of you. Okay, thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter at Jason, Instagram at Jason. And Calacanis.com, uh, the book, Angel, coming out July 18th. And if you uh, tweet your receipt, I will uh, reply back to you. Maybe I'll buy you a hamburger. That's, that's going to be my new strategy. <laughs> I'll buy you a hamburger if you buy my book. Um, my guest today, Laura Huang, and she is uh, a professor at Wharton School of Business. And she has done some of the most interesting research that I've seen, which is gut feel and investing, especially in the angel investing uh, space. Before we went to uh, the quick break, I was um, joking and mansplaining, white-splaining, <laughs> uh, exactly uh, how marginalized groups and why they don't get investment. But I have my own theories because I've been doing this and I've watched a sea change occur. In fact, yesterday we had interviews for the incubator. We had seven interviews and I was actually blown away. It was the most diverse group ever. Uh, two African-American founders, three women, one Indian, and I think one white guy, like a Euro one European, Caucasian. And I was like, wow, the world is changing. This is fantastic. We had a real pipeline problem. Um, and we're, we're sort of fixing the pipes, I think, or we're somehow figuring it out. I think it's all Jackie, my producer. Uh, you joke about, or not joke, you studied, and I'm joking about, attractiveness. Yeah. 
let's talk about attractiveness yeah. in relation to getting investment or perception by angel investors. Yeah. So um, my co-authors and I, we had this this uh, this this thought that you know. There is this, we, we do see this prevalent disadvantage that women entrepreneurs face over male entrepreneurs. And we can talk about that as well. But we saw this kind of disadvantage and we thought, you know, might there be, how do you, females perhaps prevent against this or what are the sort of boundary conditions around this? You know, females tend to spend lots of time getting ready and they spend lots of time on their appearance. And, and might it be that actually attractive females don't have this same disadvantage that okay. unattractive females face. Okay. What we found, however, was that um, both unattractive and attractive females do worse than, than both unattractive and attractive males. Okay, so, so if we were going to make the four quadrant box yes. of attractiveness one to 10 and then just gender A or B, what is the box that is most easily fund? Give me the boxes yeah, in order so of fundability. Yeah, so what happens is basically females are not funded as much as men. But attractive okay. men get an extra premium. Ah. So attractive men are funded the most. Really? Unattractive men are funded, not as much as attractive men, but more than women. Okay. Either attractive or unattractive. That's right. So women are, attra are, are funded less than men, but attractive men get an extra premium. Interesting. Yes. Uh, how do you determine attractiveness? Is there a scale like a Myers-Briggs or something <laughs> of attractiveness? Yeah. And so, how do I get my hands on this to yeah, improve to compare, my chances? Could you, how do you compare this with your own? Your I just want to hack it. I mean, what do I have to do? Do I change yeah. my hair or do I wear suits with ties more often? I don't know. Yeah. So we, so the re way we did this was very research-driven and incredible amount of pre-testing. So okay. what you do is basically um, you have you gather images mm -hmm. of just a huge huge portfolio of images. And you just have people, what we really wanted to look was just base, you know, instinct of what you think is attractive versus not. And so mm -hmm. we basically had both men and female rate both men and women, um, male and female both rate both men and women on a scale of one to seven, okay. how attractive or un how attractive do you think this person is? Right. One being very unattractive, seven being very attractive. Got it. Right. And we had all of these sorts of things done. And then what we did was we basically did a variety of different pretests where we would match different men versus women on that scale. Right. So the two people who fell right in the 3.5 or five people who kind ah. of fell. And then also on the sixes, also on the twos, mm -hmm. and basically sorted through all of these, these different things. Interesting. Um, and then we also used use that in one of the studies where we had um, men and women given the exact same pitch. So they had the oh, exact wow. same slides, the exact same pitch. And the only thing that we changed was the picture of the entrepreneur. Wow. And we used Now, did either. they pitch in person or did they just, you just submitted the pitch with a photo? Nope. They, it was a, you could hear the audio and you could see the, you could see the, um, as they, they kind of went through the, the slides. Uh -huh. So you were basically watching, looking at the slides and looking at hearing a voice okay. that was reading through the slides and giving the pitch. Got it. And you would see the image of the person. Okay. But yeah. you didn't see their actual presentation. Ability. Nope, because we you wanted to it. control for any sort of non-verbals. Exactly. Right, or, that's what yes, I was thinking. Yes. Okay, and what did you? And that's how you found out exactly that ugly men do better than attractive and unattractive women. Yes. And attractive men are in the best cohort. That's right. Does height have to do with this? Because I know that uh, for some reason yeah. they, they say CEOs are always mm -hmm. taller. I don't know if that. Yeah. And so that's something that we we would love to study further. Yeah. We actually controlled for height because there's yeah. all sorts of other factors that go along with that. Um, yeah. You know, we could also look at race, ethnicity, all those sorts of things. But right. But for that question itself, we wanted to basically control for that. But, you know, a lot of these sort of gender and this gender work that I'm taking forward, um, I am looking at a lot of those different factors. Okay. So. So here yeah. are some um, things I hear. Yeah. Uh, and I'll say these, I'll put these in the category of OH, overheard. Okay, yeah, give it to me. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> these are not my beliefs, but, you know, listen, I'm a white male. Yeah. And uh, I hear things that sometimes are disturbing right. behind closed doors because people assume, oh, it's the white male club. We can say all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. So uh, women are not as, con this is an overheard. Yeah. Um, Women don't think as big or build as big projects, yep. so they they don't they're not as bold right. or as aggressive or as outlandish as their male counterparts as CEOs. Mm -hmm. This is either a perception or uh, uh, that I hear from some folks. Right. Women are 
I'm not going to use the word mousy, but the word I, I kind of got that signaling from uh -huh. some of my contemporaries yeah. who say, I just, you know, I, I see female founders just don't think it's big. They don't think it's aggressive. They're, yeah, they're not trying yeah. to take over the world. Right. Uh, did you study that at all? Or did yeah, that come so up in the uh, interviews or data? Yeah. So it's so interesting. So there's a, a bunch of things that you're touching upon. Um, I mean, the first is that we tend to have this view that you know, male Caucasians are dominating what's happening here. Right. But people have biases here being technology in the technology, yes, in the kind of technology, high tech, right. high growth startup world, right? right? But people have biases against everybody, right? right. they everybody has something that where they've encountered some sort of disadvantage or they've okay. encountered some sort of bias. And what I teach a lot of my students and what I teach in my courses is that you have to find a way to use the biases that people have against you in your favor, in a way that, ah. what is it that's particular about your experiences, your background that allows you to be uniquely situated in this opportunity mm -hmm. and this venture? And if you can portray that, that gives you that unfair advantage, right? Ah. And I think so that- So you believe you can hack bias? I do. I think, I think that bias- You don't think people are I think are we just... can address bias uh -huh. and I think we can also hack it. And I'll tell, and I'll tell you a little bit about where I think that it's bias- It's pretty controversial I know, right I know. So I don't know how, I don't no, know how no, this no. is- yeah. I think honest about it. So honestly. I also yep. think that bias is not quite as black and white as we think it is. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Um, in some of my latest work, um, I had this, I, I had this thought that, you know, when we hear about the, when we hear that male investors are biased against female entrepreneurs, right? right. There's lots of reasons for that. One of the reasons may just be what you're saying before, which is that the opportunities are not big enough, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, these are not big enough. Perhaps females are looking at female-typed industries right. where they don't need as much capital. And in which case, of course, they're getting less funding because they're seeking out less capital. So you're right? saying women so, might pick businesses that are uh, a more appealing to women th and that some portion of them might be smaller in scope. Perhaps, right? It could be Perhaps. that those industries just need less capital. And so uh -huh. when we look okay, at the fact that men are raising more capital, it could just be because the industries that women are in hmm. require less capital, Got it. right? However, there are also females who are in industries that require lots of capital, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not the full story. There's obviously, there is something, I, I truly believe that there is some sort of disadvantage, but it's not helpful just to say that there's this bias. It's more right. helpful to try and disentangle why that is right. and how we, and why that matters, right? right? So the other thing that I was thinking is that what happens a lot, especially in a lot of these pitch competitions that yeah. I, that I've been studying is that when you see investors um, and they're watching these pitches, whenever they're seeing a pitch for regardless of what the gender is or what the race ethnicity is of the entrepreneur, there's always concerns, right? It's, there's this list of things that I still have concerns about X, Y, and Z. And then during the question and answer period, they'll ask questions and they'll be able to say, okay, now I've checked off this box. I've mm -hmm. checked off this box and I've checked off this box, right? right. But if men are asking different questions mm -hmm. to male entrepreneurs for whatever reason, ah. and the males are able to respond in certain way that allow them to check off these boxes, ah. and the females answer in such a way that perhaps it doesn't allow the investors to say, okay, now I've, I've able to, I could diffuse the risk in this situation. Right. Now I can check off that so box. how you answer investor questions could differ by gender. And how the questions are being asked. Got it. Could differ by gender. Could impact how the entrepreneurs respond as well. Ah, so when we get back from this final break, I want to know if the uh, investors are behaving differently in those circumstances because of the pressure, uh, valid pressure on the investment community to see more diversity. In other words, yes. the massive spotlight on venture capitalists because of how white male dominated it's been, is that actually changing their behavior and uh -huh. their filter in some way? In other words, is the world getting better or are they just doing window dressing when we get back on This Week in Startups? Hey, everybody, I want to tell you about a great product, which you've probably heard about, but maybe you haven't tried yet, and I have tried it, and I love it. It has become a big hit in my household with my seven-year-old daughter. It's called BlueApron.com. My wife loves it, too. Go to BlueApron.com slash twist, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is an incredible experience. You get a box. It's obviously refrigerated, and all the ingredients 
and a beautiful menu card and a recipe card of how to make the product. So I've always wanted to make pizza at home. I've never done it. I mean, I made English muffin pizzas. You know, so we call Irish pizza when you grow them up in Brooklyn. But they sent a beautiful pizza dough and beautiful sauce and cheese and everything, all perfectly portion sized and an easy to follow recipe. Then the other thing I've always wanted to learn how to cook is General Tso's chicken. That was one of my favorites when I was in New York and I was living on the west side in Hell's Kitchen. I walk home from the garden after watching the Knicks win a playoff game. I get General Tso's chicken. I never knew how to make it. They give you all the ingredients, a little cornstarch, so all these little syrups, and you, like a little uh, professional chef, everything just goes smoothly. It is an incredible experience. It's also affordable. You get a ton of variety. It's super flexible. You get the deliveries when you want. Um, and it really, it, I was just amazed by the quality of the bok choy, of the chicken. Everything was the highest quality. And it saves you not only from going to the supermarket, not only from getting a recipe, but also the portion sizes and, and how to put this all together. It makes cooking delightful again. And they are in partnership with 150 local U.S. farms, fisheries, ranchers. And they, you know, so I'm a big seafood fan and we love going to the Mon Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium. And when I went there last time, they had this beautiful card that told you which fishes you should order, which are sustainable. But it's very hard to, to actually get that uh, certified. You know, people lie when they sell you fish. You don't know what you're getting. You don't know if it's actually sustainable or not. And even some of the stuff that's farm raised is actually not good for the environment. Well, you know what? Blue Apron takes all that away. They do all of that important work for your family. And it's very important to our family that we order sustainable stuff and we and we don't take stuff from the ocean that's not sustainable. It's a, it's a big movement uh, amongst considered people. So the fact that they use the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch list to me and their standards is very impressive. Um, prep is, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. It's super, I mean, we did it faster in some cases, but we're fast cooks. Um, it tastes great. It's easy. It's a better way to cook. It is a better way to cook. Just, and also delicious. I mean, I made this beautiful Sicilian pizza and my daughter ate it all. It was one of those great experiences where we, you know, she was looking in the oven, counting the minutes. So blueapron.com slash twist, blueapron.com slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you'll get your first three meals free with free shipping. It is amazing. All right, let's get back to this amazing program. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and you can follow the show at TWI Startups, or you can join the community, which is community.thisweekinstartups.com. We have a private community of 2,000 of the most rabid This Week in Startups and startup fans, and uh, you can join us and discuss the show, the one percenters, as we say. Uh, my guest today, Laura Huang, and it's pronounced, uh, well, it's pronounced Wong, Huang, but it's uh, Spelt, and you can follow her on Twitter, Laura, L-A-U-R-A-H-U-A-N-G-L-A, H-U-A-N-G-L-A, and she is a professor of management and entrepreneurship at Wharton, and she is doing some of the most interesting, and let's face it, it's kind of radioactive uh, as a discussion, but I love having this discussion <laughs> because what I've learned is the more candid we could be and the more we can put sunlight on it, the quicker the wound is going to heal, and yes. it's clearly a yes. wound, right? yes. Um, now you're in a lucky position of, I think, because you're a female doing the research, uh -huh. do you find that people are more apt to participate with you? What, what, it, what's the behind the scenes reaction to a you, woman doing research on male bias and bias and understand this? Are people on guard when you talk to my contemporaries, a bunch of white VCs or angel investors, are they scared to death when you say, I'd like to talk to you <laughs> about gender bias and angel investing because people have been getting their butts kicked in a major way in our industry, you know, because of the horrible statistics that we see. Absolutely. No, I think that's a great question. Um, it's actually funny because I, a couple, a lot of my co-authors are males, right? And, right? and so I almost have this internal experiment where when I present work, what is the reaction versus when they present work? What is the reaction? Um, and the funny thing is, you know, I, I really, um, the reason why I think this is so interesting is because I really want it to be about meritocracy, right? This is something that we we tend to think about entrepreneurship as it's about the quality of the idea. It's about how good the people are and yeah. all these sorts of things. But there's actually lots of other subtle undertones and subtle cues and signals that are driving the process. Right. And 
it's not necessarily that I absolutely do want there to be equal opportunity and I do want it to be a, mer- a meritocracy. Um, but I, I truly believe that I want it to be about the best idea and about the best way going forward. It's a and very if that's, American concept that yes. the best idea wins, the hardest working person wins. But we all know that reality and yes. our, and the ideal, the American ideal is not obviously the reality. Right. And sometimes it's not going to be the female who has the best idea or has the biggest market or has the most investable Mm. venture. And I think that that's completely okay. Mm. Um, It's more that I want to highlight where these subtle signals and cues, the gut feelings, those sorts of things do come into play and to be aware of those so that we're able to make the best investments regardless of these sorts of things. So, you know, I don't actually, it's not that I'm advocating necessarily for investing in more, in more women entrepreneurs. It's more that Is it possible that this disparity is based on pure quality issues or is it based on something else? And that's really what I'm I'm trying to investigate. Have you come to any early conclusion on this? In other words, if you were to, it's obviously a mix of things. It can't be only one thing. Yeah. But if you had to favor it in one direction or the other of women, uh, something about how they present or the ideas Uh and is the main issue or how their these uh, investors and their own biases, which one would you say is one and which one is number two if those are in fact one and two? Yeah, Can gosh, it's such a, oh gosh, that's such a, that's such a tough um, question. And I know this is such an unsatisfying answer because you right. really want me to order them one and two. <laughs> so are they I, I think, in your mind, you know, you I, don't, take I actually don't, no, I mean, I think both go into it. I yeah. don't think it's just one or the other, but it's also tricky because investors should be, and they are looking for, they are looking for that ROI, right? right. And that's part of what they're looking for. They are looking for those home runs. Mm. And, you know, it is a philosophical kind of question because mm. If those subtle signals and cues are leading them to invest in a male, for example, because that male is going to be more persuasive or is going to be able to create more opportunity, then it's hard to say that other people aren't going to have those, that they're not going to face. Uh, Do you see what I'm saying? Like so You're saying the reaction of the VC saying, hey, this male counterpart was more aggressive or convincing or outlandishly big thinking. And other people are going to, it's going to resonate with other people more so as well. Ah. So even if you yourself are not thinking that yeah. you want, right? So there's there's that so whole aspect the next to employee it. or key management team member, they may have that same experience that the VC had. So the VC then might in fact be right that this idea isn't big and bold enough. Exactly. So right? when you, let's get into the hacking piece. If you were going to give advice to a friend. yes. Like, let's say one of your good friends says, hey, and they're female, I'm going to start a business. What would you tell them are the secrets to convincing white male or male VCs who control the purse strings of investment or early stage investors? What are some of the things you can do? Yeah. To hack that. Yeah, that's per- that's exactly what I'm very, that's what a lot of my recent work has been on, which is mm-hmm. how can how can female entrepreneurs inoculate against mm-hmm. these sorts of Love biases it. that might be there against it, right? Because I am trying to create this meritocracy where females who have these great ideas, but perhaps are facing these leaky pipelines where they're not getting access to funding, they're not getting access to mentors, they're not getting access to all of these different opportunities, right? So one piece of advice is exactly, which is, don't number one, those biases are going to be there, whether or not you could try and control against them or not. So find a way to use those biases in your favor, right? right. Um, try and show if you're, for example, even and in, in, you mentioned before um, some of my research on uh, accent for mm. so people who have an accent get funded less than those who don't, right? Um, and so if that is the if that is the, by the baseline, by inve- this is an American accent, right? The, right. Yeah. So, but there are sorts of things around British accents. You see more you know, intelligent, yeah. those sorts of things. But this is just on a pure baseline. Sure. Um, those with an accent uh, get invested less than those without. Now, mm-hmm. it has nothing to do with communication. So I've actually found mm-hmm. that when you ask people how well did they communicate, there's no difference in whether or not you can understand what they're trying right. to communicate. So we're not talking about the famous Paul Graham essay where he said thick accents and not being able to understand a person 
was yeah. Um, well, we're talking about problem. that just a little bit. Mm-hmm. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Because that but, was, right. was very, that was you, very controversial. You know I yeah. do know that piece. It was what very, is your take on that? Yeah, I have, I, a take. I have a hot take. Yeah, I think that. Um, I think that. You know, at the basis, if you take his comment on just the pure basis, that obviously it was not the the most kosher thing for him to say. Right. Um, but I think that his intention behind it was something different. Right. Um, and so I take a very what, what ba- th- tell you they, that is what he was trying to communicate. I think he was talking about being persuasive, and he was right. talking about having that political savvy and the skill around it. And that's right. what I also found was that what people do is that. The communication and the accent, it's more about how influential, how persuasive, how politically skilled can you be? Now, the issue is, is that we know that we can't discriminate based on things like people's accent. Right. But we can all agree that things like being influential and being persuasive Mm. are important things. But it just so happens that accent is correlated ah. with those sorts of observations. And that's when it becomes a problem, right? super When we we hide our bias behind things that do have validity. Mm. So there where I advise people, so back to your question, what do I advise a friend is that make sure you're pointing out things that, you know, if you know people are going to have a, a bias because you have an accent and you, and you know that it's because they think that you're less able to fight for resources or yeah. be influential, make sure that you're saying things like, you know, I know it might seem like I can't, that I wouldn't fight for my, re- for resources for my team, but let me give you an example of a uh, time when I, you know, it. did such and such and actually putting it out there and making it much so more diffusing obvious. Diffusing it right from the get. Oh yeah, for sure. So if I had a thick accent and English was my second language saying, forgive my accent. Yes. I know that I have a little bit of work to do, yep. but I have been you're really working on communicating better because when the company goes public, I know I'm going to need to be on CNBC and be super convincing. Or more so, make yeah. it a humorous sort of thing where ah. you're saying, I'm ready, my my voice, I've been training my voice to be ready for CNBC. Yeah. And there you're already showing that you've got that ambition. Yeah. You're ready for that. You recognize all those sorts of things. And same thing with gender, right? Yeah. You know, I'm going big with this. So for example, like even yeah. if it's a market that seems small, it's a female typed industry, yeah. you know, putting right out there that, I intend to go big with this. Here's yeah. how. Here's what my metrics look like. Here's what my numbers look like. All so this, this sorts of things. This is a very things. interesting point we're kind of triangulating around, which is what I've found is, and I have a lot of female founders in my portfolio, and I meet with, I basically meet with female founders with a lower, um, I shouldn't use the word lower, uh, I have to say this politically correct. I will meet with female founders who are earlier uh, in the development of their startup than men uh-huh. because I want to see the ratio change. Right. In other words, a woman who is in month four of her startup has a better chance of meeting me than a man in month eight because I don't see enough women in month eight. Uh-huh. Therefore, I have to look earlier if I want to change the ratio. And that's a great tactic to so kind of do moving that. Upstream. And, and there's lots of investors out there that are really pushing the envelope, like Alicia Surrett and yeah. Nisa Moyles and lots of fabulous women that are out there that are mentoring and doing things. Yeah. Um, exactly, you know, those sorts of things, pushing so people what early. what I found is the women who are willing to correct the men and stand up to them, and say, oh, that's a very interesting uh, assumption you have there. It's actually incorrect. We've done our yeah, research. like and I've been doing to you. <laughs> well, yes. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think it's when one of the things that I, I find in this dynamic is, and when I coach my female founders of how to handle these situations, I'm like, you know, in a lot of cases, you're the expert and an investor might be pushing you and they do this independent of gender or race or anything uh, or background or where you're from or what college you went to. They're pushing you. They're pushing you, and it's a physical push. Like, hey, uh, what, uh, what if Microsoft or Google decides to do this? We're using probing questions to see how you respond to hard questions yeah. because it's an indicator of how successful you'll be in the future. And that's those checkboxes that I was talking right. about, right? You have all of this, you have all of these concerns. You yeah. have all of these things that are holding you back from investing. Yeah. And you want to be able to check off those boxes and say, yeah. okay, now that concern has been addressed or right. that concern has not been addressed. And if men are more willing to respond accordingly so that you can check off those boxes, you're going to be more likely to invest in those people. But if the female entrepreneurs are able to respond in turn, right and check those boxes off and get those concerns off the table, then perhaps they would be invested in Here's just an example. As much. A female founder, if you, uh, and I've seen this happen, where uh, an investor will make a great point, like, you know, Google could do this very easily. Yeah. And I've seen a female founder say, in a very pragmatic way, yes, that's true, and they have more resources than us, and that would be a real problem. Like, that's actually the truth. Yeah. 
But then I see male founders, and they're like, Google. Like they did with, and then they mentioned five products that Google shut down. Like <laughs> right. Google's completely right. incompetent. What are you talking about? Right. You know, like and they ask Elon Musk, like, oh, Apple's going to do a car. Right. And he made this off the cuff remark, like, have you seen the Apple watch and how terrible it is? And he, he kind of like backtracked, but he totally dismissed yeah, them. And he yeah. was like, oh, yeah, L look at the Apple watch. It's a joke. Ha ha. You know, Apple making a car. Ha ha. Yeah. He's kind of like really dismissive and aggressive in that uh -huh. way. And in delusional, and also in a way, I find that the male entrepreneurs have a delusion that nobody can compete with them. Mm. And then I see women who are sometimes, and I don't want to use the word mousy but, and bossy, but that's what Cheryl talked about of like, hey, you tell women don't be bossy when mm -hmm. they're young. They need to be bossy in this position because you're the boss. And that's right. why the girl boss movement by Sophia Amorosa, I think, yeah, yeah. hit a tone with people. Right. Is The women who are bossy and who are forward and who are challenging to the investors, I see do better. Am I right or wrong? Well, there is some backlash, though, that happens as really? well. Yeah, there is, right? There's this big warmth competence trade-off where ah, women- wait, wait, say that again. Warmth competence trade-off. Okay, tell me what that where, is. Where there is, women tend to stereotypically be seen as warm and be rewarded when they're warm. And ah. men seem to be t stereotypically associated with competence and rewarded when they're competent. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that there's is this- Is that in life or in startups? I think it's in life. It's been examined huh. mostly in leadership situations and right. in organizational situations. But recently I've seen it also in startup environments and, mm. and investment environments as well. But what happens is that um, there is this double bind where when women try and demonstrate the sort of aggressiveness and risk seeking and the behaviors that are st stereotypically male typed behaviors that they face backlash. Um, and so there is that element as well. And so you do have to kind of manage that trade off between those two things. Interesting. I do think that that's an issue um, where I do see that women have been, I don't know if it's a societal thing or a parenting thing or what it is, but hey, you know, don't be rude or, you know, it's important that people like you. And then I see male founders who are like, I give a shit if you like exactly. me. Like, why would I care? You're the enemy. I'm going to destroy you. Right. Um, how? Let's talk about the role of aggression. Okay. Is that an indicator? Do people like, in the same way they like good-looking people, do they like aggressive, confident people? Um, and is that, does that play into um, biases in investing? Because... If I have seen aggressive, confident people mm -hmm. succeed, then it's in my head. And then if there aren't as many female founders historically, and it's the first generation or second mm -hmm. generation of them really seeing a large number of them, maybe they themselves are not aggressive and confrontational and aggressive. Um, is, is the aggressiveness advisable or not? And have you studied it yet? Yeah, so confidence is good, right? So you want to be you want to be certain around what you're trying to do. You want to be open. There's a it's an interesting mix of. I mean, arrogance is not always good, right? Mm -hmm. Arrogance is something that turns people off. They they're seen as not. not <laughs> but you wouldn't invest in somebody if they didn't seem coachable at all. If they seemed like they were. That's, that's not correct. Really? Yeah. Okay, so that's tell actually me more. Not correct. Let me ask. <laughs> let me ask you the question. I don't want to give then. my secrets away, but the more difficult the person is the more I'm drawn to them. Honestly, like literally my life. So I've been way too nice to you today. I must, no, I, I should be true. much more difficult with you. Well, I don't, for a professor doing studies, I'm not <laughs> looking for aggressiveness. I'm looking for intellect and intelligence. But I do know that um, the sharp elbows yeah. sometimes are the people who will not back down and not give up. And if you show me a founder who is balanced and normal, yeah. I will show you a balanced and normal return. If you but show the me abrasive people are going to be abrasive to other people as yeah, well, I including hope. customers, including other investors, so they do need to including know where to suppliers. Point yes. And yes. so that can be a real detriment if your if your elbows are too sharp right. and they're pointed all over the place. You know that abrasiveness can also be a huge turnoff. Yeah, Steve Jobs and. Uh, Bill Gates would be the two counter examples. Steve Jobs always, almost didn't make it, though. He got kicked out of his own company. Correct. And, and there's the fine line. There is a fine line. There is a fine line. I do find that the people who are abrasive or considered obnoxious or considered uncoachable are also the ones who correlate with indefatigable and um, willing to pursue an opportunity that is outsized and 
have impossible odds. So I'm going to take the opportunity to disagree since you said you like disagreeers. Yeah, sure. I think you can have that tenacity without needing to have that abrasiveness. You can. And I think that the tenacity that's demonstrated with the the ability to be influential and persuasive mm. can be can go a lot further than again that abrasiveness. And I You're think right. That abrasiveness does matter in the market, and it does. But anyways, we can compare notes later well, on. Thing, like, <laughs> when you look at Steve Jobs, there really are two Steve Jobs, right? And yes, there are two Bill yes, Gates. Yes. So the Steve Jobs 1.0 was, was, was so abrasive that people didn't want to work for him, or some would be inspired, some would be terrorized. And Bill Gates was known for just just demolishing people in meetings with how, you know, he would just call somebody stupid according right, to reports. Right. Like, and he was incredibly, you know, intellectual and intellectual and aggressive in his pursuit of excellence. So you look at those two individuals early on, they were irrepressible right. and obnoxious and according to reports and just very hard to deal with. And then later on, they learned to shift gears. So yeah. my actual working thesis yeah, of this yeah. is early on when you're the underdog, yep. that, wild, banshee, you know, the rabid dog. Yep. As opposed to the elder statesman. I kind of look for that rabid, aggressive insanity. Especially for new entrepreneurs. So that's some, that's an empirical question that you and yeah. I have to test then. We'd have to test <laughs> it, exactly. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I, don't, I almost don't want to talk about this because yeah. I feel like my edge as an angel is that I am able to deal with difficult personalities because uh -huh. I am a difficult personality myself historically. And there's also other variables though, gender, yeah. you know, all this sorts of things. But go on, you said you're, you were, you're talking about how, how difficult you are. <laughs> well, I'm not anymore. <laughs> okay. And so it doesn't serve me to be difficult now. Uh -huh. um, you don't have to be an older statesman, especially if I'm going to be married. But when I was younger, I was difficult. And I know a lot of difficult people in their youth. And I've seen that succeed so I think I have biases uh -huh. towards people who are aggressive and difficult because I also see those people in some ways as being able to pursue the outlandish. But I, I don't think it's exclusive. Mm -hmm. So when I do see it, I don't negate it. So I know some people do. Mm -hmm. And this is really where it gets interesting because I give people advice. Like if somebody's over negotiating, you probably don't want to be in business with them because they're difficult except if they're over-negotiating and their performance is stellar. So if you're Elon Musk or Travis from Uber and somebody who has just got outside performance, you have to deal with, uh, and I'm not saying either of these have this quality, but you know, if, if they're uh, super negotiating and very detailed, that's what, that comes with the package in, uh -huh. in a way. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's an interesting perspective and I think that there's something there. Um, you know, I just... There is some backlash too. Travis from Uber is facing lots of well, backlash with that. That sort of, you know, it's interesting you raised that example because, yeah. um, because you know, maybe it works in the short term. Maybe it gets you that financing in the early stages. But um, number one, I'm not sure it works for everybody equally. Um, right. It doesn't work for all underdogs in the same way. Right. We have different types of underdogs and also, you know, what happens later on. So I think it's what something, you, uh, yeah. interesting question to test. The, what, the way I stated to people is what got you here will not get you there in all cases. Uh -huh. So what gets an aggressive founder, Steve Jobs, you know, or Travis or Elon or pick the person, Bill Gates, what gets them into the market versus massive competition from incumbents and they're an underdog, once they win, they have to shift gears and yes. become magnanimous in victory and become this magnanimous, magnanimous elder states person. Uh -huh. Where, you know, and I think Trump is a perfect example of this. That rabid insanity drew people to him. And now that he's in office, people are like, we, we don't want that anymore. Please stop holding rallies and saying crazy stuff. Lead a different way. Right. So it's like the fight gets you in, yeah. but then you have to change gears later. But it, that is only one archetype. I have met people who are quiet and considered introverts who do exceptionally well, and they're, they're not abrasive And I'm guessing in, in your portfolio, you have a blend of everything. Of course. So, yeah. 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 All right. Let's go through some of these charts, because everybody loves a good chart. Okay. I, want, I have this one in front of me, which is figure one. Okay. An exchange-based model of the entrepreneur-investor <laughs> relationship. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a little messy. Um, and I'm gonna, we, since most people are listening, we'll walk them through it. Um, and we'll have all of this on thisweekinstartups.com. So when you find the episode, if you look at the show notes on YouTube or SoundCloud or on This Week in Startups, you'll see links 
to all this and you'll probably the actual images. Yeah. So this was a paper that uh, that I, I did with my colleague, Andrew Knight, who's okay. at Washington University uh, in St. Louis. Um, and it was really on uh, the entrepreneur investor relationship mm -hmm. and the chemistry between ah. the entrepreneur and investor. And in the very early stages of this paper um, and this project, you know, we talked a lot about how the entrepreneur investor coming together, it's a lot like a marriage, right? You go through these stages. First, you're kind of, you know, a peacock showing your feathers if you're the entrepreneur, trying to attract the attention of the entrepreneur, of the investor if you don't know him or her already. Right. Um, and then you go through this pro process where maybe you have some mutual disclosure, and then there's trust building, and then you get to this point at which you crystallize your relationship and you really have, you, you crystallize this ongoing relationship where, in fact, there's multiple investments or the the investor follows on with follow on investments or follow sure. to the next company even. And so um, what this figure is really showing is that there's lots of complexity mm -hmm. in how this relationship develops and in this developing this chemistry between the entrepreneur and the investor. Um, so there's absolutely the signaling mm. that happens in the beginning, and then you go through and develop the different parts of the relationship. Got it. Yeah. Where does the point at which um, you act, act absolutely disappoint each other and don't appreciate each other? <laughs> because that is the definite piece of this. Well, there's also that the, disillusionment. That, yes, there is this this in that within that embedded within that trust, right? There is yeah. this disclosure where you do feel comfortable disclosing both this this negative pieces as well as those positive pieces, and that's where the relationship does develop too, where you're able to say to the investor, like, look, I'm really feeling uncomfortable by this, but you're able to yeah. have form that that mutual relationship. And it's also not just financial resources. And that's right. part of what you're saying as well, which is there's also these social resources. It's that yeah. support system. It's the mentoring. It's the, um, you know, referring people to people in your network, sure. um, all of those things that go along with uh, the financial investment yeah. and it really differs what stage the company is at and what stage the relationship is at. You want to really make sure you're able to as an investor root for the person. Yes. And so what I always find is if you're not rooting for the person anymore, you need to get out of the investment and, and be clear about that. Yeah. Like I, it's very hard for me to root for you for these two or three reasons. One of the most interesting things I can tell you about this dynamic is when I invest before I invest in a company, they are so communicative with me it's to the point of, in some cases, annoying. After you give your money to the person and it's you're an like investor, crickets. it's crickets. <laughs> so what I've done to deal with this is I tell people, hey, I, I want to do the investment. Here's some of the ground rules. And we sometimes memorialize these, or we actually, some of these rules are memorialized in what's called a side letter, uh -huh. which is an agreement beyond the just normal transaction of additional behaviors and or covenants between me and the founder. And one of them is a monthly update. Because we knew that I get some, t some companies I passed on investing on multiple times, put me on their monthly update. And then people that I've given hundreds of thousands of dollars to, they do not update me and yeah. I have to keep emailing and chasing them. Did anyone in that first category ever turn into a, a investment that you made? Yes. So if they keep me in the loop and I see demonstrable progress over time, um, that is very attractive. My over But anyway, so I, one of the things I, I just... I want to tell you my theory of investment and, tell, and let me see what you think. Okay. So my overarching theory of investment is that I'm betting on the person. Yep. And I don't think that's new or special. Mm -hmm. What might be unique is I have a theory that if the person is going to do great work in the world, they'll be doing great work right now. So if the deck, if the email to me, if the interaction, the way they answer questions, and the craftsmanship the, and the diligence in which the product has been created, mm -hmm. if I see signals of extreme, um, that the person's an extreme craftsperson, mm -hmm. in other words, they know how to make something really good mm -hmm. in the world, it eliminates a lot of risk for me. But the rest of it is me using my poker skills to look the person in the eyes mm -hmm. and see behind their eyes and see into their soul mm -hmm. if this idea really matters to them and if they will wake up every day and pursue it doggedly mm -hmm. and not give up. In other words, I believe that the being indefatigable and resilient are the things that make for a good investment. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking and probing for that in my discussions with the founders. 
What do you think of my theory of angel investing? I think that's what your gut feel is. That's I think gut your feel. gut feel is is looking into that person's eyes and seeing that you see that tenacity and you mm. see that commitment and you see, you know, I have some of the interviews that I have from investors. You know, one investor told me that, you know, he had this guy where he had – you know, two mortgages on his house and employees he couldn't pay and all of these things. And the only thing he kept saying was like, I got to get back to work. I just have to, you know, the, I just got to, right. And that's, that, that's painting a very different picture. You know, you, you have the, um, r- so he versus, didn't like that or he did like that. Well, get back to work for yeah. him was yeah. get back to this company, get ah. back to the startup, keep doing yeah. it. Even though I have all of this debt, right. even though I have all of these sorts of things, that's that commitment that, got it. that, you know, you're looking for. Um, but, and, and it's funny because a lot of times you can spot this. Some investors can see this very quickly. They can tell in five minutes, yeah, five seconds even, whether yeah. or not they see this quality or not and whether or not they like this person, right? right. It's things like, I would have set this guy up with my daughter, yeah. right? And I would Did set him up. Did somebody say that? Yeah, I would wow. set, I invested in him because he's the type of guy that I wanted my daughter to marry. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Right? I have three and daughters. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> So that, that, you know, that's, there's something there. And I think that's exactly what you're articulating. Hmm. So let's look at this chart here. This is figure one, the effect of perceptions of the entrepreneur on propensity to invest. Right. So the perceptions, what we as investors think of the entrepreneur and are, if we're likely to invest or not. Right. So here, this is really what you were saying about it's the person, right? Mm. It's this horse and jockey sort of model. It's really about the person. And if you've got, what's interesting here is that if something is really, it's got strong business viability and you really have these positive perceptions of the entrepreneur, you know, you're overwhelmingly going to invest. But what's interesting here is that if you have positive perceptions of the entrepreneur, but you think it's really weak in terms of business viability, you're going to be much more likely still to invest than wow. somebody where you feel there's strong business viability, but you have a negative gut feel about that. That's fascinating. So to state this or to restate it, investors would rather invest in a strong person, mm-hmm. whatever that means, yep. somebody they consider a strong entrepreneur yep. with a bad idea yep. than a weak person with a great idea That's right. and a great market. That's right. So their gut feel is going to trump their assessment of the business viability. This goes back to my basic rule of investment, which is I don't need to know if your idea is going to succeed. I need to know if you're going to succeed. That's right. Which is what I tell people. Like I really, because the biggest investments I missed, Twitter and uh, Zynga, which I had an opportunity to be in the first rounds of, I actually talked myself out of the investment. Because, and I was friends with Mark Pincus, I was friends with Evan Williams, but I just thought the ideas would never work. Because you did you did all this due diligence and you yeah. due diligenced yourself out of investing in this. Correct. Even though you had this strong sense that this would be something that those people would be something. So yeah, that happens a lot. And that's, you know, and it happens especially when um, in, in a, you know, again, I, I talk about the difference between angel investors and there are a lot of angel investors who are always like, well, who else have you talked to? What kind of due diligence have they done? Let me ask. And, um, you know, but it's really about spotting that diamond in the rough. And the more you talk to people, sometimes you basically wash out that gut feel that you had mm. about someone and that ability to spot that 30X or in your case, 300X home run. Yeah, no, 5,000. <laughs> Five to 10,000 is what we're looking for. Uh, You're you know, so humble. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not even humility. What it is is I just have learned that I tell people when I'm, when I'm talking to a founder, I say, okay, I'm looking for 100X plus. You're asking for a $10 million valuation, which means this needs to become not just a billion dollar business, but because I'm going to be diluted 50% or right, more or right, less yeah. by the time, it really needs to be a $2 billion business. So my 1% will go down to a half, half a percent of 2 billion, you know, we, we sort of get where I need to be. So explain to me how this is a 100x business and how you get there. And most times they can't. Yeah. So then I say, okay, so... What you're investing might work for mom and pop or, you know, double, single and double investors, but you're talking to somebody who's trying for home runs and grand slams. Yeah. We need to come up with either a lower valuation so that the exit point doesn't need to be as high. So instead of a $10 million valuation, a $3 million valuation, now we have to, we can take a third off of it. It could be a 600 or $700 million exit on a 2 billion, or we've got to reconceive 
conceptualize this business to something that could generate much more revenue. And when you talk like that to people, they understand real quick if they're a venture-based business or not. And I put 100x out there because it's challenging. Yeah. If obviously, you know, I've had 10xers and 20xers in my career that, you know, those singles and doubles can be nice for a portfolio, but they don't make an early stage portfolio. You need something much, much greater. Um, Okay. And so uh, a question from our audience. Um, How often is the gut call more just an angel betting on the jockey versus the biz opportunity or projections, which is similar to what I've been talking about? That's a question from Patrick. Yeah. So I think... um, most often, the the gut feel is originating from your perceptions of the person, which right? is what that chart shows. Exactly. It's yeah. um, now it's informed by the business for sure, right? There is this dotted line sort of thing where um, you can have a gut feel about the business, but what you're really, but you do have these numbers around that, and regardless of whether they're actually hard or not, I don't believe that they're actually hard numbers because they're just projections and assumptions. But people do base a lot off of that, but their perceptions and their attributions, that's where the gut feel is originating from. Now, there's also some that, you know, it's not always that clear cut. A lot of it is also post hoc rationalization. There's lots of other things that are happening, but it's originating from perceptions of that person. Hmm. Yeah. Um, In this figure too, the effect of perceptions of the entrepreneur and the amount of investment. Yep. This is clearly showing the solid line shows that somebody who you have positive perceptions of, Mm -hmm. uh, which probably means confident, uh, they answer questions well, uh, some of those qualities, they get much more money. That's right. Even with a bad idea. That's right. Than the weak, uh, the the negative perceptions of an entrepreneur. So a negative entrepreneur with a good or a bad idea gets a very modest amount. That's right. So the dollar amounts go up. Yeah, and this dollar amount it was just on a scale of zero to forty thousand. Got it. Um, just based on sort of, you know, the typical amount, not typical, but the the sample that I was using, yeah. the average amount that they invest is around thirty thousand dollars, and so we kind of scaled it based on on that. So yep. Um, does your study track in terms of beauty, because we go back to how good looking the person is, <laughs> I guess. Yep. Um, obesity. Okay. Uh, because I also had a theory that if people, uh, that some people perceive obese people uh-huh. as being, having less self-discipline and control, therefore would be less fundable. So I have not studied that, but I'm going to put it on my list. Really? Yes. See, I think that's a fascinating yeah. question because yeah. they're using a perception that they have to make an attribution around something that matters, some characteristic. Correct. Yeah. Right. I also think smoking is another one. So you haven't studied this about smoking no, and haven't. how investable. It sounds like you want to go back and get your PhD now. I do. I've always <laughs> wanted to. Actually, I was, I, my, I, my undergrad's in psychology and my dream was to go for either forensic psychology or industrial organization. So I'll let you apply to work with with me as my doctoral student. There you go. I'm going to be a doctoral <laughs> student. But I don't even think industrial organizational psychology exists anymore. Somebody told me that it does it's sort of... It exists. They still yeah. have IO psych and those sorts yeah. of fields. But, yeah. you know, it is... The, depending on what... It sounds like you're much more applied. So it seems I like... I would be more applied. Wanna, yeah. yeah. Applied. I, or whatever. Anyway. So I took a group of entrepreneurs aside who I had talked to and they were at their demo day and they were outside the front of the demo day and three of them were smoking cigarettes. And I took them aside and I said, hey, guys, you want a pro tip? And they said, yeah. I said, don't ever let any investor see you smoke in your life. And they were European and they were based here now. And I think they were German or something. I don't can't remember what they were. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, in the United States, people look at people who smoke as having a mental illness because anybody who smokes, knowing how many years it takes off your life, they're going to think that you're stupid. So don't ever let anybody see you smoke again. And by the way, smoking is very stupid because it's going to take 10 years off your life. And they looked at me and they were like, really, Jason? And I was like, they're like, we're huge fans of the podcast. Where I was like, trust me. And they, one of them told me later on, like it was one of the best pieces of advice he had because when they said they had to go for a cigarette break or they came into a meeting smoking, somebody was like, are you smoking? Is somebody smoking? It's just here wow. in California. The idea that somebody smokes in California. Yeah. In 2017, People would just be like, what? So my first reaction to that story is that, wow, you're ballsy that you go up to people. But my second reaction is that, well, you probably took off, you probably added some years to their lives. Right. Well, that's you prob- possible. Yeah. So, well, so percent- entrepreneurship maybe takes some years off your life, but then if you quit <laughs> smoking, you get them back. 
Uh, how many years have you been doing this study now? Like, I think you started in 2014 at this or 2015? So I, my, I finished my PhD in 2012. Okay. Um, and this was some of the stuff that I had started working on then. But I've taken this forward in the last couple of years to look at more like we talked about earlier in terms mm. of how do you actually inoculate against these sorts of things? And yeah. how do you think about meritocracy and favoritism and the perceptions and cues? Yep. In your gut, do you believe that Silicon Valley is a meritocracy? the technology industry and what we do here? No. You don't? No. <laughs> there you have it, folks. It's not a meritocracy. <laughs> it's not. What do you think it is? How would you describe it, if, if not a meritocracy? It's not just Silicon Valley, though. I think well, let's a, talk specifically you know, about I, it. I think yeah. um, it's a larger question, but... Um, so you're uh, confirming that biases exist in the world. Yeah, and <laughs> I and that and I'm trying to do Shocking. my yeah, I know. I'm trying to do my little part yeah. to address this and understand this and like I said, disentangle this so that we can you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to be able to create an entire meritocracy within mm. Silicon Valley, but you know, there are um you know, it's just these being aware of these perceptions and cues and how they're driving behaviors, um, I think is really important. And I think, um, you know, the book that I'm hoping to write, yeah. um, you know, is really around there. Some people have an edge mm. and some people don't have an edge. And how do you navigate within that when you don't have an edge and how do you create an edge Got for it. yourself? Got and so it's really around that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. See, I, I like your pragmatic um, prescriptive approach as opposed to a just um, what I think is a major part of the problem is that in this discussion you have people who are very upset by the fact that the world is unjust. Uh -huh. And what I always tell people is of course it's unjust. Have you, have you not been paying attention to That's the history right. of humanity? Yeah. Of course it's there, it's not a just world. People say that the world is not fair. Right. The reason the expression the world is not fair exists and it rings so true. And truly. that's what we tell children too. Right. Like life's not fair. You got to right? You got to you got to That's right. right. That's right. So if we know it is not fair, then all that is left is to hack it in your favor and to realize that the ultimate hack is performance. And this is where I get myself in a lot of trouble, but I do believe that if your performance is the hockey stick that Silicon Valley is looking for, your gender, your age, where you were born, and your accent mean nothing. So if that is true, and you can tell me if you think it's true, that a person who has undeniable traction for their product or service will get funded. They may not get funded to the same level, may not get funded by the same people, but they will get funded, and they will get funded continuously if they have performance, then it is the greatest hack to have performance. I think that it's it's a causality issue, right? Mm. It's I totally agree that if you have that performance, that's the yeah. greatest hack. It's when you're not allowed to achieve that performance mm -hmm. because all of these other things are the precursors or the antecedents to be able to achieve that 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 sort of performance, right? Um, you're sounding like an Asian mother to me, which right. is that, right? It's you have sometimes you have to work twice as hard. Yeah. Right. But what are you going to, what's the other option? The other option is that you work, right? You ha Sometimes you have to work twice as hard because if you didn't have those barriers, yeah. you wouldn't be able to achieve that performance. And you're only going to be able to achieve that performance by working twice as hard. Right. And so it's this circular sort of thing. And so in essence, yes, I agree with you, but I'd right. like to take a little bit out of that where we can have much more of that feedback in achieving that performance so that the hack works a little more efficiently. Right. So that you don't have to work 10 times harder to get the same recognition. Perhaps, Maybe yes. you could just work twice as hard or That's one right. and a half That's times right. as hard. That's right. Well, this has been an amazing episode. Uh, we have determined that the world has significant biases. We have determined uh, and confirmed that uh, good-looking people get more money, perception matters, and that there are hacks and that there's much more study to be done and that I'm a tiger mom. <laughs> there you go. You've said it all. Um, What's next for you? What's the next study? You, you want to write a book? I'll put you in touch with my book agent. I would love to write a book. Yeah. That's my what next. What do you want to write? Oh, so you want to write a book about how to overcome this nonsense? I want to write a book on edge. On edge. When oh. you have an edge, yeah. what does it look like? Hmm. When you don't have an edge, how do you create that for yourself? Yeah. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about unfair competitive advantage. That's right. No conflict, no interest. See what I'm saying? I do. <laughs> no conflict, no interest. That's what I tell people. They're like, isn't that a conflict? I'm like, absolutely. Here we go. No conflict, no interest. Uh, but getting an edge will be part two of our discussion with Laura. This has been a great episode. Follow Laura 
Uh, she's L A U R A H U A N G L A. H U A N G L A. And um, there's a, if you just type her name into uh, the Google, I saw a lot of videos with you, and you had a Coursera course. Oh, I do. I do. And I, I do. watched a couple of videos from that, and you had a really good one on pitching. Oh. Uh, and elevator pitches, where. And the, do, is that all of Wharton's on Coursera now? Not all of Wharton, but okay. there are portions of, of you know, that of, of the curriculum that are on Coursera. So you can take yeah. a course with you for free on Coursera? I don't know if it's for free. Ah. Maybe. I don't know. I think I you can look at all the I'm curriculum sure. for free if you want to Perhaps. take the course and get papered. Yeah, maybe you that's pay. what it is. Yeah. Do you actually yeah. um, manage that MOOC, Massively Online course? Yeah, I don't it? manage it myself. It was ah. more just the content. But more yeah, of the content. Yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, this has been great. Uh, continue the work and uh, I'll talk to you after. There might be some ways for us to collaborate. Maybe. Sounds good. Thanks yeah, so we much, have Jason. A, we have a lot of, um, but you're not selling anything. You had nothing to sell. I have nothing. But I, I'm trying I can, to give you a plug here. I have nothing to sell. I can come up with something to sell. Well, when you have your book, you sell that. <laughs> That's the right. Edge book. Uh, I'll introduce you to my um, my book agent, John Brockman, and then I'll introduce you to my editor at Harper One, Collins. Her wonderful. name is Hollis. I think that would be great. And, I think uh, it's people need to know how that there are biases and that you can turn those biases in your favor. So yeah, yep. we're trying really hard here and. Um, uh, as a just a side note, Founder University this summer, founder.university, yes, there is a university subdomain now. And founder.university, we haven't announced this uh, except right now, but uh, Jack and I had a talk. Founder University is going to be taking place in uh, the second week of July, two days. It's the entire curriculum of the launch incubator put into two days. In other words, if we were going to have you in our 12-week incubator, you can come for 12 hours and get the entire curriculum in two days for free. And this class we're doing this summer is going to be female founders only. You heard it first. No men, female founders. Last time we got about a third female founders. We said, F it. We're just going to go for it. And we're going to say, we'll find 35 women founders to come to this course. And so if you're a female, email Jackie, a female founder, Jackie at launch.co. Jackie with a Q at launch.co to come to Founder University this summer. And it's uh, hosted at our friends, uh, Wilson Sonsini, the greatest law firm in Silicon Valley, uh, based on uh, what everybody thinks. All right, Laura, great job. Thank we'll see you, you all next Thanks. time. Bye-bye. 